Hey, welcome back to Armchair Architects here on the Azure Enablement Show. You might recall we're in the middle of our AI season, and who boy, do we have a conversation for you now. We're going to talk about danger. We're going to talk about all the things you have to be concerned about when it comes time to start doing this stuff. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about AI and how uh, various forms of it um, can be really beneficial to architects and can be really beneficial to the things we build. But I am really conscious of the fact that it's not all happy bunnies hopping through the meadow, right? There are some real concerns we have to pay attention to before we can really use this stuff. For example, um, it's really cool that when you can talk to an LLM, it's less cool when the LLM gives away the company's secrets. So can we talk a little bit about uh, confidentiality and what architects have to think about and what they do about that situation first? Yeah, so the, the way I was thinking about this over the holiday break was uh, as an architect, uh, I think that there are maybe like three or four things that I worry about in this space. Uh, the first are certainly ethical and responsible considerations for architects integrating LLMs uh, into any type of design collaboration or application experience. Now you might say, well, what's the difference between traditional worry about um, statistical modeling and um, AI and ML versus LLMs? Uh, and my hope is that we'll chat through some real world examples today of unintended LLM, LLM training on things like confidential information, leaked or unintentionally present, um, you know, uh, secure information in the corpus of data that you use to train LLMs. There are potential societal biases and discriminations that may be embedded in the corpus of training data for LLMs. Uh, and then architects really need to think about like, what are some strategies for pla at the platform level for data anonymization, access control, algorithmic transparency, uh, and asserting those things to regulatory bodies. Uh, and the specter of increasing regulations that might appear in this space. So lots of rich things to think about and to talk about. Um, so those are the things that I think about uh, in this space. Uh, let's, pick, let's pick on something that you mentioned, which is transparency in algorithms and uh, responsible AI. Okay. Now, let me call um, a little bit of a, a break on this one. <clears throat> because transparency of algorithms, that's a really nice idea if you're doing a little bit of data science and have some statistic models. If you have a large language models with trillions of variables, and by the way, the model is a closed model like uh, OpenAI or Gemini or uh, other models that are anthropic and so forth, um, how are you gonna go get transparency of algorithm? You won't. And now everybody in the responsible AI world started to say we need explainable AI. You can't explain a large language models with trillions of variables, it just doesn't work. And so I think part of what uh, the large language models expose into this world is the need to re rethink what responsible AI means. And to answer some of the questions you kind of posed into the room, I think it starts with a very clear picture of what are you going to choose as the uh, basis of your large language model? You really have two choices. You go for closed models, again, OpenAI, Gemini, whatever it might be, or you go for open source models a llama and lots and lots of other things. There's 4,000 new models on hugging face every day kind of thing. Um, and that has its own dangers. While there is a little bit more transparency because this, the source is open, the code is still very complex. You might not be the expert to really understand what that model is. And you also might not know um, who is behind the model. Is this a viable organization that has the right intention? Where did this model come from? Uh, do they adhere to specific um, promises uh, that they give you in terms of that the model doesn't steal? How do, who, who, how do you know that the model doesn't have code embedded that you just can't find or it's, it's hard to find and stuff like that? So let's start with which model are you going to pick, which really means which partner are you going to pick? And then when you pick a partner, you have to say, what are the promises that the partner is actually giving you? Uh, with OpenAI, there is a version called Azure OpenAI. And Azure OpenAI gives a couple of promises. Like, for example, um, we will never use your data to train uh, the foundational model. That's a guarantee we give you. And as Microsoft, we stand behind. I am sure Google and AWS are doing something similar. Um, we also tell you that all data that you feed into the OpenAI model, uh, that, or the Azure OpenAI model to be precise, 
is actually isolated from any other uh, data that is uh, being hosted in the same multi-tenant service. And that's a guarantee. And this is something that the company Microsoft stands for or the company Google stands for or whatever it might be. And I think that's where you start. Um, pick the right partnership, either open source or closed source and think through what you want to achieve uh, with that capability. And then when you're looking at, then you say, okay, cool. Now I need to look into my ethics um, and my responsible AI. We, because obviously we want to use AI responsibly. For me, that has two big pieces. When I talk about AI on stage, either publicly or in uh, conversations with uh, specific customers or partners, and they're all excited about AI, I love that. I say, look guys, the first thing you need to do is have an AI charter. What is your company going to do with AI and what is it not going to do with AI? Uh, so that every employee that you work with and every partner that you work with understands what your, your job, uh, what you think the job of AI in your world is. I think that's a reasonable ask. Uh, Microsoft has been public about what we think AI will do and will, we will not do since 2015, very clear. This is what this is. It's a public piece, very transparent. And every employee also has a path to escalate if there is effectively a usage of AI that's being proposed that we, that you as a person don't feel comfortable with, there is a path that's not part of your organizational management path where you can escalate and ask, hey, is this really in line with our values, with our mentor and so forth? So this is for me building block two. So mm -hmm. first you pick the model and the partners. The second thing is, what are you going to do with AI and what you're not going to do with AI? And then the last piece that I always say is, when you're looking at large language models, you can't go for explainable AI. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. The thing what you can do, in, do is you can say, we can go to observ observability, not explainability anymore. We can observe what's going on. So a large language model, uh, if you interact with it, you effectively use a prompt. We talked about prompt engineering uh, the last time. You could argue that a prompt is like a model itself. You know exactly what the structure of the, the prompt is going to be, what you, you are going to add to the prompt before it enters the LLM, those kind of things. And you can observe what goes into the prompt. And you also know what's coming out of the prompt, I meaning out of the LLM, sorry. And you effectively say, I can observe what the output is. And you can also model, uh, create a model for the um, output uh, using JSON, for example. So OpenAI has a model, but there's other open source capabilities like TypeChat that force the large language model to respond as a JSON or with a JSON schema, which means you can now reason over that schema as a model and say, oh, only data that fits that schema will effectively end up in my response prompt. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very good way of saying, yep, I can guarantee, I don't know how the LLM gets to the result, we can mathematically prove that it's right, but we don't know exactly how the code path works. But we know what we fed in, and we know what came out. And we can enforce rules against the uh, input and the output. That's what I mean about observability. So these are the three elements that I generally, when I work with clients and partners, I talk through in terms of start with the right partnership, what is your AI perspective, and then how do you go and observe rather than explain AI. Hey, host stepping in here from the future. I had so many questions, so many questions. I think we're going to take it in the second part. So I hope you'll join us in the second part of this episode. And thank you for watching us here on the Azure Enablement Show. Mm -hmm.